Hello and welcome to the lecture on masculinity studies. In this lecture we're going to take a look at the readings from Michael Kimmel, Phil Petrie, Messner, Drummond, and Kenway, Fitzclarence, and Hasluck. So we're going to take a look at different notions of masculinity as well as other concepts which it may be connected to and learn about how it has evolved as its own study especially in relationship to and contrast from gender studies more broadly, and feminism. So the goal here is that in the development of masculinity studies as its own field, right, so you can now actually become a major and get a degree in masculinity studies, which is pretty new. The notion here was to challenge what we have come to know as heteronormativity, right? So the norm, in a sense, meaning that we presume that everyone is heterosexual. And the reason that that is going to come out as being so central to masculinity studies is, I think, best captured by the first paper that you're reading this week by Michael Kimmel, right? And so this is going to be a series of concepts and uh, framework, ways of understanding what it means to be a man, what it means to be masculine, and thus what it means to be a straight in terms of notions that are going to be antithetical to what it means to be a woman and what it means to be feminine, right? And so we're going to be tying up notions of one's sexual orientation here with sex and gender, which as we learned in the previous weeks is a result of that sort of essentialist, naturalist, or biological determinism as um, our sort of underlying assumptions or views of reality. So that is the sort of problem that these different views are going to be trying to tackle. Um, but it's also going to, of course, underlie some of the more outdated conceptions of masculinity, as we'll see. So essentialism, again, is the idea that both se uh, sex and gender are really one and the same, and they are determined by our biology. And of course, this conception of biology, again, makes an incorrect uh, description of nature in presuming that there are only two biological sexes. And then shooting off from that, the idea is that your sexual orientation would be heterosexual, right? That's that nor heteronormativity piece. And thus we assume that the opposites, in this case, attract to one another, right? And so one of the interesting offshoots of this is not only does it not accurately reflect reality um, in terms of both human and non-human animals and their sexual preferences, but it also has this sort of other interesting implication in that it doesn't allow sex acts, right? So we're not talking about sex, your biological sex in this case, but actual sex acts to be a utility of pleasure. They're really only seen as functioning for the purposes of reproduction, which um, I would hope one would think is in and of itself a very outdated sort of concept of, you know, why sex can be and is meaningful. Um, in our lives and in our expression of our own identity. But um, I think that some anthropological studies um, really in show that, you know, the evolution of the sex organ, as we saw in one of our previous readings, does give some signifiers that it could be serving as a function for something other than reproduction, right? The, the location of the uh, pleasurable parts of our sexual genitalia, right, certain sexual acts that both humans and non-humans engage in that have absolutely nothing to do with the goal of reproduction, right? So there's just a lot of activity that occurs in nature that just goes far beyond the idea that sex is only for the purpose of reproduction, right? And so this essentialist view doesn't really allow for us to view sex in that way. It also, of course, doesn't allow for notions of gender let alone sex or sexuality, to be socially constructed, right? Because we're seeing these things under essentialist perspective as being fixed and already predetermined by nature. As a result, right, if one presumes that this is in fact an accurate description of reality, then we have this sort of normative implication that if this is how things are, then this is thus how they ought to be. And that makes it really difficult for individuals who are marginalized or oppressed by these views to fight against them, right? There's no room within these theories to push back against that oppression since it is deemed to be the quote unquote natural or as we see, that's often conflated with what is morally right situation to be in. And so, as I'm hinted at, right, this is going to bring up um, an assessment of masculinity 
that really comes as an offshoot of the development of feminism over time. So in the um, coming slides, I have uh, some more information, but what we're gonna be looking at is really the development of men's studies, which emerged in the 1980s as its own area of research. So this is well after, you know, uh, decades um, after feminism had, you know, been prevalent in academia for a while. And so, you know, as we've discussed, feminism was not all inclusive in its origin. And so it took a while for feminism as an academic discipline to consider, right, that men's gender might also too fall under some of the issues that feminism is trying to deal with. So we start to see this own, uh, this other area emerge in the 1980s, but it too, just like feminism did, started off with a rather narrow conception of what masculinity and what uh, gender was, basing a lot of its views on sex role theory and unfortunately, this presumed that all men were in fact the same, right? That we, you know, if we grow up in these certain roles and we have this understanding that's based off of an essentialist idea, that men will sort of all develop um, in the same ways. And as we know, everyone grows up in different situations, right? So moving forward a little bit, you know, social constructivism is gonna allow for more diversity here. And so to push back on this narrow conception of masculinity that emerged in the 80s, in the 90s, feminists were very skeptical, right, of what men's studies was kind of shaping up to be. And this had to do with the fact that their own theories had become a little bit more progressive at this time, you know, not as progressive as they needed to be, but more inclusive, right, moving in that direction. And so they were already starting to see gender as non, a not singular thing, right, something that could be more diverse, whereas men's studies as a newer discipline wasn't quite there yet. At the same time, right, we're dealing with a moment, especially in US history, where a lot of women were um, entering the workforce or had been in the workforce. And so there was more of an effort to get, you know, pay equity and uh, dis uh, eliminate job discrimination based on sex and these other things. And this got a lot of pushback from some groups that had emerged in the, under the umbrella of men's studies, specifically different types of men's movements, which we'll take a look at in a second. Um, men's movements are going to be, again, just different sorts of schools of thought that count as under the umbrella of men's studies. And because they are gonna themselves be diverse, some of them are going to be pro-feminist and some of them are gonna be anti-feminist. But, as men's studies has evolved in and of itself, right, it has no doubt become a part of feminism in today's understanding of gender studies. Um, so we no longer really tend to make a difference between men's studies and women's studies, right, in the sense that it's all seen as falling under the larger umbrella of the feminist movement, right, in that both of these separate disciplines have now come to evolve their thinking, right, moving from a notion of, you know, gender kind of being one thing, like that all men or all women experience the same things. That's the sort of hegemonic conception, which we're going to talk more about, to seeing, okay, perhaps there are diverse notions of gender that maybe capture different socioeconomic situations, but then to realizing that even if two people share the same racial identity, same the same, uh, share the same socioeconomic status, right, share the same gender, they could still have very different experiences. And so again, we're seeing this move within men's studies as we saw within women's studies and feminism more largely to become more inclusive and allow for greater diversity. So to take a look at some of these men's movements, we can start with the oldest, which again is not going that far into the past, but in the 1980s, it's called the mythopoetic movement. And this was um, sort of begun by um, or based upon the work by Robert Bly, and it was seen as a reaction to, against second wave feminism, right? So if we remember what second, second wave feminism was about, right, this is talking about the notion that the personal is the political. So moving some of the issues that women were facing in the domestic sphere out into the public sphere to be legislated, right? So that there could be uh, legal protections for women in those different areas. And so this unfortunately is going to be one of the um, least inclusive and most anti-feminist branches of the men's movement, which makes sense given that it was one of the, it was the first. Um, and its aims specifically were to liberate men from what Bly and others considered to be modern constraints, right? So if you have women in the workforce, the idea was that this would somehow potentially reverse gender roles at home, 
meaning that men would have to be the homemakers. And they saw this as um, something that undermined their masculinity. And again, presuming essentialism as, as individuals did at this time, the notion was that these things are opposite, right? And so if being a masculine man is positive, right? Then of course we know from Simone de Beauvoir that anything else is considered the other, is considered less than, and so that feminization was seen as very detrimental to men's health, right? Uh, let alone to their identity. And so the goal there in order to liberate men from the constraints of their home was to get men in touch with their quote unquote true masculine nature. And this literally involved going out into nature um, and getting in touch with your masculinity, which I can only imagine what that would mean. I don't know, like hunting and chopping wood and I, whatever men do to make themselves feel manly. <laughs> I, I, I'm unfortunately only getting very um, kind of silly stereotypes in my head, right? That um, men need to get away, right? To be separate from, to get back in touch with perhaps some prehistoric uh, notion of what it meant to be a manly man. Right, and I would hope that anyone who is part of, um, you know, a, a, who's fortunate enough to be part of any sort of family unit, right, or have individuals in their lives should know that, you know, your role in the home need not undermine your masculinity in any sort of way, right? But this was the idea at the time. And so the goal was to enjoy a sort of powerful and transcendent communal experience, right? So um, I don't know if it's like, you know, nowadays we have like the, the man cave in the house, right? So this was, of course, before anything like that sort of concept existed. And so men would have to, it was seen that they had to leave the home to get away from the women, to get away from the domesticity, to get in touch with their masculinity. And this was seen as being not only something that could help their sense of self and identity, but was perhaps also tied to some sort of spiritual notion of self-help, right? So they may have in fact been trying to deal with issues that, you know, men needed help dealing with, right? If there, if there were some sorts of changes happening in society that, you know, made them question maybe the traditional notion of what it meant like to be a man, that's an important thing to, to deal with and to talk about. Um, it's just sort of unfortunate that this men's movement found that the only way of dealing with those was to separate themselves from those changes, right? And to sort of try to recapture some, some earlier moment in, in their history or human history where they could maintain um, what they had been accustomed to. And then um, later on, this ends up moving into, in the late 80s, early 90s, the Jungian movement um, from Carl Jung, who was um, a very well-known psychoanalyst. And this was seen as a reaction against the previously predominant uh, views held by Freud, which we saw, um, or we talked a little bit about in our discussion of different uh, theories of gender. And so if we recall, right, Freud, although he allowed for the social construction in a sense of um, one's gender identity. They don't really talk about one's biological sex, but your gender and sexual orientation are really manifestations, according to Freud, from based upon your relationships with your parents, right, or those who have raised you. And even though it allowed for things outside of the um, sex gender binary and outside of heteronormativity, unfortunately, those were labeled as the results of errors, right, quote unquote, something went wrong in your development if you fell outside the binary. So it allowed for those labels, but really connected them with a pejorative sort of um, assessment. And so the aim of the Jungian movement was to sort of flip this idea on its head and talk about the fact that it's not that, you know, there are these two sets of characteristics and then someone could, you know, move beyond them if something goes awry, but in fact that we all have elements of masculinity and femininity in our unconscious mind, right? So um, this, if, if we're even presuming something like biological essentialism here, right? If we go to the basics of um, our chromosomes, right? Everyone has an X chromosome, right? That's the chromosome that's needed for life. So you're either XX or XY, right? Or unless you have um, a third chromosome, right? But still, everyone at least has an X chromosome. And so even if we're taking that very basic essentialist understanding here, that X chromosome has traditionally been tied to femininity. And so we can extrapolate from that the idea that whatever we make of the masculine mind or the feminine mind or anything in this arena, 
we all have those different concepts in our in ourselves we have maybe just been socialized to emphasize one or focus on one or allow one to develop more so than the other and the idea was that focusing um, or maybe limiting your identity to just one of these sets of concepts could really do great damage to yourself right because you're really blocking part of yourself off and not ever allowing yourself to explore it or come to know what it is or let it inform your life or decisions right and so if each person has both of these things it would be important for us to cultivate both of those components right that that would be the healthiest way of um, exploring yourself and reflecting and so the idea would be to uncover those connections right between our unconscious minds and our conscious identities right so if someone was having an issue that they would you know try to deal with through psychoanalysis the idea was that perhaps the solution could be to allow yourself to explore maybe parts of your identity that you have been told to be ashamed of right or that you have been guilted into um, you know kind of stuffing way down such that you you never let those things emerge and so there those would that would of course very reasonably lead to um, uh, difficulties in your life emotional psychological whatever they may be right and so the idea is that you can grow as a person by exploring all elements of your identity and not just focusing on those which maybe society has told you are appropriate right in that they quote unquote align with your gender or sex this moves into in the later 90s um, into the gay men's movement where we see the idea that again it's not just enough to talk about masculinity and femininity even um, together in the way that Jungian explored because this is going to have unfortunate implications for individuals who are part of the LGBTQ movement right um, so the idea was that okay perhaps everyone has masculine and feminine components but again do those things have anything to do with our sexuality right and if they do what is that connection um, we write the presumption again is that we don't just want to assume that if a man is in touch with his quote unquote feminine side that that need to say anything about his sexual orientation right so this type of thing and so they um, were strongly reacting against um, hegemonic masculinity the idea that to be a man implied lots of different other things not just things about your sex gender sexual orientation but also about you know what sort of um, temperament you should have what sort of preferences you should enjoy right so the idea is that you know oh I I didn't know that that person was gay because they really like sports right it's like you know we, we make all these connections about who people are supposed to be and what they're supposed to like and so the gay men's movement was really trying to push back against even putting things into these two concepts of masculine and feminine right and maybe breaking down or expanding um, those associations right and so the aim here was to challenge the traditional notions of masculinity and femininity right so it's we're slowly moving again in a more progressive direction and this is going to rely heavily on the idea that these notions of masculinity and femininity are not just parts of our unconscious mind right that maybe we've hidden or whatnot but that they actually come from outside of us right they're socially constructed and then we internalize them and so this leads us to a larger categorization that runs throughout these movements as men who would be considered pro-feminist within them or anti-feminist so to give you a sense of what pro-feminist men in these movements would have looked like right they were the ones really pushing the issue of who could say they are a feminist and you know so they get a lot of credit for challenging the idea that to be a feminist you had to be a woman right so the idea is that a, a man could very much be a feminist even if they weren't a woman or weren't um, you know falling outside of what it meant to be a cis man or to be heterosexual or anything like this right that you need not be perhaps part of one of the marginalized groups in order con to consider yourself a feminist and so they aim to challenge the notion that you must be the subject of oppression or inequalities to be considered a feminist nowadays you know we are there's a lot of discussion around terms like allies and things like this um, so this these are conversations that have been happening for a long time right who gets to use what labels um, since of course those labels do a lot of work and 
we use them to express uh, a lot of our ideology, and so it's going to be important, right, who is allowed to have those labels and who isn't. And so pro-feminist men at this time wanted to be considered feminist because they were primarily concerned with violence against women, specifically sexual violence, as well as the ways in which certain types of products were consumed by men which might have oppressed women in certain ways, much like the discussion around pornography, right? So what are ways in which men can consume these, these types of products that does not make them anti-feminist, right? And so there's been um, a lot of discussion just in that industry in particular, which you can explore if you're interested. Um, but the idea here is that is there a way in which, you know, what it means to be a man can occur in the world without it being connected with these things, right? Can a cisgendered man, heterosexual, be a feminist, right, by taking up these issues, right, helping to address them in certain ways? So this is as opposed to men who, in some of these movements, primarily the earlier ones, uh, specifically the mythopoetic one, would be considered anti-feminist. Not to say that there couldn't be anti-feminist men in the Jungian or gay men's movement, right? But to be an anti-feminist would mean that you are rejecting or reacting against one of the feminist principles that we talked about earlier in the quarter, specifically the normative claim or the descriptive claim, right? So you could be anti-feminist in that you think there is no gender inequality, or you could be anti-feminist in thinking, well, there is, but it's supposed to be that way. And so unfortunately, most of these anti-feminist men fought against the normative claim, right? So they did acknowledge, m many of them did acknowledge that there was gender inequality, but thought that that was the natural way that things should be, right? So they thought that the existing social arrangements, such as they were and such as they are, being patriarchal, right, with men, um, maintaining most, if not all, positions of power in the social hierarchy were not just natural, but a lot of this ends up being tied in with religion, and thus that they thought that it was divinely planned, right? So however things are is how God or God's, right, whatever religion someone might um, be operating under, that this is how God wanted it to be, and so who are we to change it, right? So this is, again, a reaction against feminists' Um, moves to try to correct that oppression, correct that marginalization, right? And so they did advocate for social arrangements that favored men. And specifically, they thought that action should be taken simply to make these arrangements more equitable, right? So they want these social arrangements to exist, and they might be open to adjusting them a little bit, but the idea is primarily, though, that they're going to be concerned with the equity for men. So they're going to be mostly concerned with men who have been left out of the existing hierarchy, more so than the fact that women and primarily people of color, right, have been left out. And so their aims in this case were not to advocate for gender equality, but to actively oppose women's equality, right? Because again, as we saw with the mythopoetic account, they saw women's movements towards equality as being part of the problem that men were facing. And this happens a lot in any, um, any instance of social inequality where someone who has been historically oppressed is trying to correct, right, or um, is gaining assistance in correcting for that injustice, the previously privileged group, you know, they don't see themselves all often as that privileged. And so when other individuals start gaining ground to maybe catch up a little bit, they some somehow see this as something being taken away from them, right? Um, so we're seeing this a lot now in um, discussions against immigration, right? So somehow, you know, allowing refugees and immigrants into the country who are fleeing persecution, right, who are looking for better lives, looking for opportunities, even for individuals who have nothing to do with them, right? They, they don't have a job that they're losing to them. There are uh, plenty of instances where, you know, farmers in the United States have said, like, we're not going to hire anyone except American citizens. And American citizens didn't even want the job. Like, <laughs> we're not even talking about, right, competing for the same resources. But they, the people who 
have been more privileged see it in that way, right? They see it as they're coming to take something away from me that they feel entitled to. And so, so we have a similar thing operating within this anti-feminist men's movement, right? That women gaining any sort of ground, right, is somehow taking something away from men. And so they thought that they needed to preserve traditional masculinity, again, as natural or divinely determined, from the quote-unquote pollution or invasion of the feminine. And so this leads into different, uh, th also sort of three waves of men's studies, which I'm not going to spend too much time on, except that we're going to talk a lot about hegemonic masculinity. And the, then, of course, we want to note how there's been a shift from conceiving of masculinity in what we call the hegemonic way, which is typically sort of coalescing the different forms of privilege, right? So by saying that we're in a patriarchal society, right, that it's male dominated, the idea is that that doesn't really give us a full picture of what's going on. It's, it's dominated by a hegemonic type of masculinity. Hegemony here meaning a, one type, right, where everyone's pretty much the same. And so the hegemonic masculinity that has prevailed has been not just male, but white, Western, and middle class. And the idea there was that any notions of masculinity were then presumed to all be the same based on that norm. And so we're going to see again through the second and third waves that this starts to broaden its focus, just like feminism did in women's studies, to the authors that we're going to be looking at, which are going to be taking the most progressive and inclusive notions of masculinity, which they're going to be calling multiple masculinities, right? So it's not just that there's diversity, right? But that even within diverse class, there can be multiple types of masculinity. And specifically that these things are social, not just socially constructed, but fluid, right? They're changing, right? What it means to be a man, to be masculine is constantly in flux. And so we want to understand hegemonic masculinity first, and then we're going to take a look at our authors who are going to be criticizing that in favor of the um, more of a third wave perspective of multiple masculinities. So hegemonic masculinity, again, began with trends to make biology coincide with social gender roles, right? So very much ut utilizing that biological determinist framework in the 70s, right, in those early earliest mythopoetic accounts. And the idea here was that since there are biological differences between males and females, there ought to be differences in their respective social gender roles, right? And so the presumptions here, of course, being that men are both physically superior as well as socially superior, right? So this is utilizing the existing inequality at the time, right, to advocate for the continuation of that inequality. Right? Whereas the view was that, of course, females are considered to be physically inferior, but also socially inferior, right? Not capable of participating in the same ways in society, nor should they, right? So again, both the descriptive claim and the normative claim get built in here, right? Thinking that they're somehow unable or inequipped, unequipped to do certain things, and that if they were to try, that would somehow disrupt right, the quote-unquote ideal social order. So this later ended up including, again, not just sex and gender, but also relationships between people. It's not just sexual relationships between men and women, but also it determined how relationships should occur between men and other men. And this laid out a certain power structure of social and political dominance that we still see heavily embodied in certain types of masculinity today, right? You might associate this with perhaps, you know, older generations, right? Where to be, a, you know, a man's man, you have to be um, aggressive. Maybe you have to be loud. You have to interrupt. Maybe you have to, um, you know, invade other people's uh, personal space, you know, when making a point. Um, maybe it's about, uh, you know, making jokes, knocking people down. You're going to see a lot of examples of this in the readings this week, especially as they relate to violence in the workplace, right? But I'm sure you can think of lots of examples where uh, masculinity and notions of it are not just important to understand in terms of the relationship between men and women, but also, again, between the relationships of men and other men.
Okay, so again, it's not just according to hegemonic masculinity that any men were superior, right? But that white, Western, middle-class, heterosexual men. And we could probably even make this more specific, right? So not just that white, Western, middle-class, heterosexual, but probably able-bodied in the West, probably Christian, right? So we have these other types of designations that I'm sure we could add to this that would give us a more accurate description of the type of men who maintain dominance in society and politics throughout our history of a patriarchal system. Okay, and so the idea again is that traditional hetero -mascul heterosexual masculinity, right, was presumed to be the norm. So when you have pos people in positions of power that reflect that quote unquote norm, it affirms the norm and then gives authentication to the idea that that norm should be maintained, right? And so everything is done to ensure that those individuals who are in power maintain that power. And that is affirmed and authenticated, not just through the social structures, but as we'll see through violence, right? Violence against those who would interfere with that privilege. And, um, you know, again, there are gonna be lots of examples, but I think it's important to understand that there is often a hip hypocrisy that goes into these types of structures and forms of violence in how they're applied, right? So um, just thinking of current events, right? Um, uh, women's reproductive rights are, you know, very much a central issue right now, especially with the um, current nomination for the next Supreme Court justice, potentially, um, you know, having views that Roe v. Wade should be overturned, right? These types of things. And I think it's important to understand that the, the very white Christian, in this case, we would probably say upper, upper class heterosexual men who have been against women's right to choose over their own bodies have often been found to have encouraged their mistresses to get abortions, right? So the idea is that they're, they're advocating for, for positions publicly that help to keep women in an inferior position by ruling over their bodies, yet those structures and those positions don't accurately reflect their beliefs, let alone their practices, right? They're willing to make all kinds of exceptions in their own personal lives to maintain their own superiority while taking this different public face to assert others' inferiority. Okay, so hegemonic masculinity is not just the idea that only these types of men, right, have power, but it then goes further to legitimize the dominance of those men over women as well as, and this is right branching off of um, earlier forms of femininity, also legitimizing their dominance over other marginalized men, right? So a hegemonic masculine structure is not just going to say that a certain type of man is in power, but is going to be utilized um, to justify the inferiority of men who don't fit that image. So this would be men who are not white, not Western, again, not Christian, not upper middle class, not heterosexual, not able-bodied, right? And I'm sure the list can go on and on, right? So this is a, a form of discussing how both women and many types of men are marginalized by the existing patriarchal structure. Okay, and so it requires not only women, right, to differentiate themselves from this type of man, but other men to position themselves in relationship to the quote unquote, most ideal man. And again, considering the element of race in this, there's been uh, plenty of examples I'm sure you can look at where, um, you know, images have been altered to darken the skin of certain men, right, to make them um, appear more quote unquote inferior, right, or more threatening to the superior white man, right, especially in politics, right, racial tags that again try to undermine the idea that this person belongs in a certain sphere of society. Again, we can see it with Islamophobia, right? Non-Western, non-Christian. We can see it in the sort of um, criminalization of the impoverished, right? Acting as if, right, they're doing something wrong, right? And that they're solely responsible for their current situation, yet, um, right, 
people in positions of power, of course, it's only because, what, they're excellent people, right? That there's the sort of idea that it means something about your character, that you are wealthy, right, and white and what, right? So all of these sorts of things get wrapped up in these classifications. So hegemonic masculinity is taking the previous gender discrimination that we've been learning about and saying that it doesn't just privilege all men, it privileges a very specific type of man, right, at the cost of marginalizing all other groups. Okay, so of course, right, the problem as we saw with thinking that all women's experiences are the same is gonna be the same here. Thinking of masculinity in this way, right, a hegemonic model is going to impose a false unity and static nature on the character of men, right? So if earlier on you were thinking to yourself, well, maybe we're not in a patriarchy because not all men are privileged, right? No, <laughs> this is just showing you that that was based on a false conception of what it means to be masculine in the first place, right? That it wasn't just all men are being privileged, but that a certain type of man was being privileged. And so this has, this uh, hegemonic masculine structure has failed to recognize, right, the many different facets and layers of gender, right? In all the ways that we've been discussing, and now we're gonna be discussing specifically in terms of masculinity. It also fails to specify what conformity looks like in practice, right? So um, I think we saw this again, not to bring up too many politics, but we saw this uh, with Barack Obama when, you know, people were discussing uh, how black he was and, you know, if he was the right type of white in, in any ways that he might have presented as white. You know, there's all these different ideas of, you know, what it means to be the right type of man in a certain situation. And perhaps, you know, if you identify as a man and are listening to this, you might be able to think of some situations in your own life where you sort of had an idea of, you know, how men should behave, but in a specific situation, you weren't sure exactly what that called for, right? So um, what would be a easy example? Okay, so we think of, you know, traditional notions of chivalry being that like men should come to the protection of or come to the aid of women or individuals in distress. So let's say, you know, you're out at a bar and someone is being aggressive with um, a woman and it seems like they could use some assistance. Well, does being, you know, the, the right, quote unquote, right type of man in this case mean that you need to just go punch them out? Does it mean you need to start a fight? Does it need, mean you need to, you know, physically or um, dominate them in some way? Does it mean you just need to de-escalate the situation, right? Talk your way out of it? You know, what exactly would it mean to come to the aid of this person in that situation, right? We don't always know. And unfortunately, because we haven't historically had conversations about the many ways in which masculinity can present itself, we tend to default to these stereotypes, which can get people into a lot of trouble, right? And it then tends to reinforce some of the more negative stereotypes we have about masculinity. And so again, this hierarchy of masculinity is not just about the relationship between males and females, and not just about the non-sexual relationships between men and men, it's also about sexuality specifically. And so one of the, I think, really interesting parts of Phil Petrie's paper that you're reading this week is how he directly spoke to his experience um, with his wife and how his being raised thinking that the only appropriate um, emotion for men to exhibit was being quote unquote cool, which really means exhibiting no emotions, how that hurt him and his relationship with his wife, but how it also, he sort of hints that it, you know, manifested in his sexual relationships with women, in that he might have been more sexually aggressive, you know, in that that was seen as the only permissible outlet for him to show emotion. And, you know, I think for anyone who's uh, studied or knows anything about sexual assault, this is very often the case, right? That that sort of violence against someone else, whoever the, the victim of that assault might be, right, tends to be a representation of some psychological or emotional issue on the part of the assailant, right? That they're not able, they must not have an outlet in other areas of their life to explore or to solve whatever issues they're having. And so this is seen as the only quote unquote acceptable way for them to show their dominance or make themselves feel better about whatever it is. 
right? And as we'll also see discussed very greatly, and as I'm sure you already know, asserting one's masculinity in this type of hegemonic model typically means, right, a notion of being homophobic, right? So being very much threatened by any other type of masculinity that at all embraces femininity. And that was seen as something that homosexual men did. Again, that is a false stereotype. But, right, even if that were the case, the question is, why would another man, in possibly embracing his femininity, be a threat to someone else's mass, sense of gender identity, right? It typically, I think, would instead invoke the opposite, that it must be a sign that they're not comfortable or confident in their own masculinity if they're so easily threatened, right, by how someone else manifests their gender or sexual identity, right? So the solution here is uh, to give us a more technical term instead of multiple masculinities is to talk about the word intersectionality, right? So looking at how not just the hegemonic model has privileged a certain type of man, but when breaking away from that model, we not only need to look at all of those different elements, right? Race, class, ableism, um, socioeconomic status, right? Religious identity, sexual, right? All of those things. But we also need to look at how they overlap with one another, right? And so feminism is going to do a lot of work to explore the, excuse me, the intersectionality of these different systems of discrimination and oppression, right? Similarly with how different aspects of our identity might coalesce or intermingle to create unique types of opportunity and privilege, right? So intersectionality works both ways. The idea is we're trying to get a more robust sense of the ways in which all facets of our identity come together to create a much more dynamic, right? As in changing and comprehensive, conception of who we are and what that means for our place in the world, right? And so what's very important here is that since masculinity is going to be just as important a component to explore as femininity, that men can do a lot to help change the hegemonic system, right? Because one, change is already happening. So it seems pretty impractical to cling to something old and outdated, right? Just an unwillingness to change. Also, because again, many men actually suffer under the existing hegemonic system. And so it actually is in most men's interest to help combat this instead of simply trying to wait, work their way up the hierarchy, which I think is um, a false sort of optimism that the people in power have, have convincingly conveyed to people, right? That, oh, you don't want to change the existing power structure. You just someday want to be at the top of it, right? So you should help us maintain that system so that one day you can benefit from it. The idea is that you're never going to benefit from it if you're not already benefiting from it. And so to be suffering under that and to maintain it is to really maintain the system that is oppressing you. And so the goal is to see that everyone or many people can benefit, right, from overturning that system. And also, right, even if you do happen to be somewhat privileged under the system, you probably care about people who are not privileged by the system. And so if you care about them in the ways that you think you do, or if you care about them enough, then you should want to work towards their equality. Re even if, even if that comes at the expense of some of your own privilege. And so um, I'm just going to give you a quick personal example. Um, when I got hired in my full-time position um, at Green River as a tenure track instructor, there was um, a man who uh, is in a, a group of philosophers in Washington State who was very upset that he did not get even an interview at Green River. And he sort of implied that I only got hired because I was an adjunct at Green River previously, right? So I, I did get an interview, which, um, right, seems reasonable. But of course, also that I only got it because I was a woman, right? That because women are underrepresented in philosophy, that they gave me special treatment in this sense. And so he asked me, you know, well, what if there was a black woman who was up for the position? Would you have been happy if they got the position over you? And I said, absolutely, <laughs> right? I would be happy to have lost out 
on the job that I got to someone who would be more representative of the diversity that we need, right? I, I was not operating under the presumption that if a black woman had been hired over me, that she must have been less experienced than me, which seemed to have been his presumption about me, right? So again, if we are being privileged by a certain situation, if we care about others, we need to be willing to sacrifice our own privilege in order to benefit others. Now, perhaps that means that I should quit my job, right? Um, and maybe one day uh, I, will, I will be strong enough to do that. Um, not that I would even be guaranteed to, that the job would go to someone in, who was more diverse than me, right? So there are lots of things there. But the idea is that we should be willing to support a system that helps others, even if it comes at the expense of our own privilege. Okay, so this leads us to uh, Michael Kimmel. Masculinity is homophobia, specifically fear, shame, and silence in the construction of, of gender identity. And I shared another PowerPoint with you um, in the media for this week that I really would like you to go look at um, that includes a slide with, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name, um, very famous, uh, Mike Tyson, very famous uh, boxer. And there's a quote from him as he is about to fight, you know, one of his opponents. And what's interesting to note is not just the vulgarity of the language that Mike Tyson uses to try to demonstrate his dominance over him, but specifically how the language he use, uses is homophobic in the sense that he is actually describing engaging in sexual acts with this man, but in a way that implies that Mike Tyson in this sexual act would be the dominant individual, the dominant sexual partner, while the other man would be taking on the quote unquote feminine part or role in that sex act. And so even though he's implying that he would be willing to engage in a homosexual act with this man, he's doing it in such a way that is very homophobic because it's putting down a feminized man and asserting to his mind, right, his traditional male dominance. So it's a really fascinating quote. Um, you know, I'm definitely not going to read it to you out loud. There's a lot of bad language in it, but I just think it's a really great example of what he's talking about, uh, what Michael Kimmel is talking about in this paper, right? And so the basic idea here in his paper is that hegemonic masculinity, as we've described it, comes from a fear of being of men being ridiculed as quote unquote too feminine and that this fear is going to motivate a lot of behaviors on the part of men which will help to maintain and then perpetuate that exclusionary masculinity right this masculinity that excludes anyone who is not fitting that hegemonic model right so the claim here of course is that manhood is socially constructed right, because it's constantly being played out, acted upon, reasserted over time, and also redefined, right, so many of the reasons we've seen before to presume that manhood is socially constructed. And so because it's socially constructed, again, that means that it does not have to be rooted in insecurity, right, if something is constructed by society, we can work to change it, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, but we can work to change that. And so we can change the fact that hegemonic masculinity has been rooted in this fear, right? It doesn't have to be rooted in competition, right? So being a man should, should not have to mean asserting your masculinity over somebody else. Uh, this reminds me of a, a master, I've been watching MasterChef, uh, and I was recently watching an episode where these uh, two men were, you know, arguing with each other in the kitchen and they just couldn't, you know, put past, you know, they couldn't let this argument go until one of them asserted their dominance over the other. And they only stopped fighting when Gordon Ramsay came in and asserted his dominance over both of them, right? And that was like the only time they felt comfortable working together. And so this notion of constantly being in competition to assert that you're the bigger man, that you're the one in charge, right, does not have to be something that we use to define what it means to be a man or to be masculine, right? And certainly this implies that masculinity does not have to be, 
seen as the opposite of everything that is too feminine or seen as not being macho. Again, just to share an example of this, um, I have a friend whose father is a very traditional um, uh, man, in, right, in, in the ways that we've been talking about. Uh, he was raised as a, a cowboy, right, so a very a macho sense of who he is, but he's been having a lot of uh, back problems as he gets older. And so his daughter was recommending that he try yoga, right? So something that is seen as very feminine, <laughs> um, even though it's not. And uh, he was very resistant to the idea until this bodybuilder friend of theirs shared with him that he happened to do yoga. There was something about seeing a man who he identified as being a very macho man, being willing to engage in this activity, that then somehow gave him permission to be willing to try it without it threatening his masculinity, right? And so the solution here is something like this, to be more inclusive, right? To broaden our definition of manhood, right? So the idea is again, if something is socially constructed, it has the ability to be shifted and changed. This is one of the primary benefits of theorizing sex, gender, and sexuality under a social constructivist lens, if not you know, a more critical lens, because the earlier views do not allow for this sort of change. And so here he goes on to talk about how masculinity is this homosocial enactment, right? And so what that means is that, again, we are enacting a certain way of, in this case, social uh, engaging in social interactions that demonstrate homophobia, right? And so this comes through show or competition, which he thinks is built up by gendered action and language, right? We're often encouraging young people, um, more so young men, to be competitive than women, right? Encouraging them to demonstrate their masculinity in ways they might not even be comfortable with. And we tend to um, try to hide signs of the so-called weaknesses, which again, are going to be things that are seen as feminine. Again, just to provide an example, um, when I first moved uh, to Washington, I was working at a daycare center and there was, um, you know, one area for the kids to play in that had dress up clothes, all sorts of things, you know, firefighters, uniforms, princess dresses, right, all sorts of different types of costumes. And there was, um, you know, preschool boys who were uh, putting on the dresses and playing with each other, right, in, in engaging in active imagination and you know i'm sure many young men played dress up in women's clothes at some point when they were young and it need not mean anything about their sex gender or sexuality right kids that age don't even have sexuality right but certainly need not mean anything about their gender or sexual identity unfortunately for one of these boys though as he was playing his father walked in to pick him up and started screaming at him um, to take off the dress, right? And I uh, was saying all sorts of other just shameful things to this, this young boy. And I mean, we can imagine what a reaction like that from a parent will do to someone so young, right? He's getting a very clear message that it is not okay, right, for him to even dress, right, in ways that he might want if they violate what in this case his father sees as appropriate displays of masculinity, right? And that doing so will get him in trouble. And so again, this is going to reinforce these ideas, right? So built up by gendered language and actions, right? Making anything outside seem weakness, right? Defining femininity as the opposition to what it means to be a man, right? And so everything that is not considered masculine gets lowered on this hierarchical scale, right? So taking this idea of what Simone de Beauvoir was talking about with the othering and now applying it to non-hegemonic types of masculinity, right? So the scale is to measure, right, hegemonic masculinity in all the ways that we've been discussing. And then other forms of masculinity become marginalized or subordinated underneath it. So here on the right, you have some uh, descriptions of different types of masculinity as they will fall under this hegemonic model, which I encourage you to take a look at if you're interested. Okay, so again, according to Kimmel, the root of this notion of masculinity is a fear of being emasculated, right? So 
it's not that the boy was afraid of being a woman. He was, he will probably forever be afraid of being perceived as a woman, right? Being perceived by others in this way. It's why so many people are comfortable doing things at home that they aren't comfortable doing when they're out in public, right? So it's not, again, this sort of internal sense of their own identity, but more a worry about how others will react if they were to uh, embody those aspects of their identity in public. And so according to Kimmel, right, and as should be pretty obvious, this not only informs elements of sexism, but also racism, right? And the this tends to cause in men a lot of internalized emotional anxiety, right? They're, they're not given the space historically, nor the vocabulary to talk about their feelings, right? And these ideas, they're encouraged to remain silent, either in receiving that judgment from others, or to remain silent when observing that judgment being imposed on someone else, right? It's, they're not seen as uh, feeling comfortable intervening in this sort of thing. And it, that can create a lot of insecurities. It's why we see such much higher rates of suicide amongst men, right? That we're not socially giving them the tools to be able to share what they're experiencing. All of that gets internalized and can be very damaging, either because they will inflict harm on themselves or that anxiety and depression will build up and then will, you know, quote unquote, explode into um, a aggressive rage towards someone else. Right. And again, that sort of constant fear of being judged by others as being less than, which can create a lot of shame, of course, if you end up being perceived as something else, or even if you think like, oh, I have these parts of myself that, um, you know, I know aren't going to be received well from others. And so you kind of learn to hate those parts of yourself, right? That sort of internalized shame, even if you don't ever share them in public, which of course can create a lot of isolation, right? If you're not comfortable being yourself around people, you're not likely to spend as much time around others or that time won't be meaningful, right? You won't be yourself in those moments. You'll be performing some other notion of what it means to be a man. And so again, this has resulted not just in violence against othered groups, right? And who those other groups are over time, but again, can also result in violence against oneself. So we want to understand with hegemonic masculinity that it's based on a faulty assumption. Just because men as a group hold power does not mean that individual men within that system feel powerful. Right? The idea is that even those men who are maybe at the top and perhaps the most privileged might see that privilege as relying upon their maintaining that notion of hegemonic masculinity. Right, So they might constantly be hiding elements of themselves from those that are closest to them or, and, or feeling shame right, and insecurity by keeping those things inward. Right? So we have this sort of contradiction that emerges, that this symmetry between who you are in your private life and how people perceive you out in reality, it doesn't really exist, right? So we have to address the fact that even people who are in privileged positions are being harmed by this system, right? The idea is that no one is benefiting from this system of hegemonic masculinity. Certainly not the people who are marginalized and oppressed by it, right? Women and quote unquote othered men, but also that the men at the top are not, you know, gonna be in a healthy headspace as long as they see themselves as having to maintain this type of masculinity to do so. So again, it's a sort of paradox, even though men benefit greatly, right? A certain type of man in this case from this institutional power, they may not necessarily feel empowered. And I think, you know, you can think of a lot of maybe one political example right now that is a perfect demonstration of that, right? So someone who maybe performs in an overly confident fashion in such a way that it actually is more of a sign of their insecurity, right? Constantly needing that gratification, constantly needing to be praised. Okay, so how can this, um, how can we affect this and how can we create change? Right. Well, of course, that hegemonic system creates a desire and an insurmountable need to be viewed as masculine, 
which, as we've seen through some examples, and I'm sure you can think of more, affect all areas of society. So we don't want to just try to escape, right, if we don't fit in or exclude those who don't fit in, right? This sort of escapist and illusion, uh, exclusionary behavior, according to Kimmel, is often used by men to keep and or regain power, right? So the idea is that if you are experiencing any sort of privilege, you will want to maintain that privilege by excluding others, right? Because again, you might be seeing that as them taking something away from you. Or if you can't deal with the emotional and psychological toll of what it takes to be in that position, you might engage in forms of escapism, right? Through some sort of substance abuse, right? Or suicide. So how do we create change? Well, we have to break the silence, right? We have to be willing to talk about what it means to be masculine in all the ways that that might be positive or negative, same with femininity. And we need to form allies with people regardless of their position in the hegemonic system, right? So we cannot maintain that hegemony, right? Just surrounding ourselves with people who are just like us. And so I've shared some images on this slide just to show you some of the changes that we've already seen right, in society, where we um, are more uh, accepting of men showing other types of emotion, or we're more accepting of men, you know, embodying a more feminine aesthetic, engaging in homosexual behavior, just being close with other men, regardless of what it says about your sexuality, right, these types of things. Okay, and so this leads us to Phil Petrie's paper, Real Men Don't Cry and Other Uncool Myths. So what I really love about um, this paper is not just that we're getting a, a first person description of this from a man of color, but that he is writing this paper at a very important moment in his life. He and his wife are about to have uh, what I think is their first child, right? So they're, they're gonna be new parents. And they're both experiencing a lot of anxiety about what this means. And so Petrie is using his paper as a way to sort of work out the issue he's having because his wife wants to talk to him about these insecurities and anxieties that she's feeling, and he finds himself unable to meet her request, and he's struggling with why that is and what that means for their relationship going forward, right? So he's talking here not just about the cultural roles, right, that he and other men have been placed in, but also what that means for what's being expected of them later on in life. So according to Petrie, right, being a quote unquote man means being rational and objective, which is something that we're gonna talk about in more detail um, when we get to epistemology in this class, but the basic idea is that a rational person makes decisions based on reason rather than emotion. An objective meaning that they are not biased towards subjective preferences. And so again, what is implied by this is that being a man means being devoid of strong emotions. Strong emotions not only being associated with femininity here, but thus with being subjective and irrational. So the assumption, right, that we'll explore later is that if rationality and emotion are opposites of one another, well then emotions are seen as getting in the way of being rational, right? So this is why we typically, when we associate emotions with women, we think that because of their emotions, they're unable to make reasonable decisions, right? And so this is a big problem that we're gonna have to unpack, but he is mentioning it here briefly. And so as rationality and emotion, you know, are seen as separate in this way, if being a man means being devoid of strong emotions, right? He sees this as, this is described as being cool, right? So being cool is not like a trendy, you know, you're wearing hip glasses and, you know, the latest whatever brand of clothing, right? That's not the kind of cool he's talking about here. He's talking about being emotionless, right? So cool as in your demeanor, right? Not letting anything get to you. And so we have some different examples here on the bottom of how that sort of cool emotionless masculinity has been embodied throughout uh, the US, throughout uh, recent history. And so what's the problem with this? Well, as he's finding with his wife, right? If he has been socialized to identify as a man in such a way that means he should not have or show emotions, then when his wife is asking him to share those things, she's not just asking him to do something that is difficult, if not impossible. 
she's actually asking him to redefine his very identity, right? To be someone else, to be someone who is capable of and encouraged to show emotion, right? And so this is a problem that he's noting, not just in the way we raise men in general, but in the kinds of problems it can create in their personal lives, right? So men know that communication is the key to a healthy life and healthy relationships, right? He's not claiming ignorance of this. He's very well aware of this fact. He also knows that being cool is sort of like a performance, right? That this is not actually, you know, being cool is not the be all end all of his identity. He's aware that he has aspects of himself that go beyond what it means to be cool, but he worries about the consequences of what it would mean to finally allow those aspects of his identity to come out, right? So we have to talk about why this is so difficult, not just for him as a man, but specifically for him as a black man, okay? So if men do not know how they feel, this is one of the big um, issues, right? So it's one thing to not admit how one feels, but oftentimes because we don't raise young boys in a way that encourages them to talk about their emotions as we do with young girls, right? We're often, girls are encouraged in so many different facets of society to talk about how they feel. Boys just aren't usually, again, that's a stereotype, but on the whole, they aren't. That means that young men are not necessarily equipped with what we might call a very large emotional vocabulary, right? They just might not have the terminology to be able to describe in an accurate way all of the complex things that they could be feeling, right? We don't often just feel happy or sad, you know, at one time. Often emotions, you know, come in all sorts of amalgamations and complexities, and we could be feeling, you know, five different things at one time. And, you know, sometimes you're, you're sad and happy, right, <laughs> at the same time. And, you know, it's just difficult to be able to define and uh, verbalize to someone else what one is feeling if you even are able to figure it out, right? Sometimes we don't even know how we're feeling. So if this is the case, that certainly means that men aren't able to talk about their emotions then in the way that women are. And so even if they were, right, capable and had that vocabulary, society, as I mentioned before, might have created a fear of sharing that, right? So what would happen? How would a woman respond? if a man finally did share his emotions. I think back to um, an episode of Friends, I think Bruce Willis is a guest star and he's dating Rachel and Rachel is trying to encourage him to, you know, open up about his feelings. You know, he doesn't talk about his emotions. And so he finally does and it's just like this, you know, gate opens and he's crying and sharing all these things. And then Rachel's like, okay, enough, right? So she both criticizes him for not being able to do it. And then once he does it, then that becomes a problem, right? So it's like a lose-lose situation for men in this in this case. They're, they're damned if they don't show emotions, right? Because then women feel like they're maybe not able to get a full sense of who they are, or they're not, you know, being open enough or don't trust, right? whatever the, that's taken to mean. But then they're damned if they do express those emotions, right? Because then it undermines their masculinity and perhaps the very thing that attracted them to the men in the first place, right? So this sharing really ends up being a form of vulnerability. And again, not just for men, but specifically for black men, right? So the idea here is that black men have had to take a particularly cool demeanor throughout the history of society because of the racism that they experience in the world, right? We have these stereotypes about the quote unquote angry black man for a reason, right? The idea is that when a black man is being perceived as angry, that is automatically perceived, right? Typically by a white mind as being a threat and usually ends up being responded to with lethal force, right? If not just violent force. And so it becomes not just a matter of masculinity, but a matter of survival for black men to maintain a cool demeanor because if they show any form of emotion they are likely to not only be marginalized in their masculinity but potentially to engage uh, be faced with violence if not murder right so there are huge stakes involved here not just in terms of gender but also racial identity
Okay, so men of color, again, are already experiencing a lack of power and control in the world. And so to share their emotions on top of those existing vulnerabilities, right, makes Petrie in this case, just very hesitant about showing his wife the, that emotional side, right? So being cool as a black man for him has been a survival mechanism. And so giving up one's cool in this sense is not just going to be perceived negatively by others, but again, could in fact pose literal danger to his well-being. And so again, we enter into a paradox, right? This unwinnable situation where we teach boys to be strong, but then ask them later on in their lives as adults to show emotion. And then if they do, right, then we cast them off as being weak, right? So again, we have this lose-lose situation here. And the result is that men will internalize their emotions, right? Internalize that sort of shame about them. And again, only express their emotions in unhealthy ways, right? He gives an example through sex, sex, right? Perhaps being too aggressive in that arena, right? But we could imagine other forms of expression or violence, right? That would also result from someone not being able to embody or express their emotions in a productive manner. And I'll just share one more example of this from my uh, personal life where um, I was engaged in a debate with uh, a member of my extended family about uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. And um, I was trying to explain to this person why I would not want a male colleague, you know, coming over to, you know, t touch my shoulders, right? Just really basic, you know, physical respect, right, in the workplace. And this member of my family was very upset because I, I'm guessing that whatever idea of in, interacting with women from their past was being threatened, right? Like they maybe felt like they had done something that maybe would now not be considered appropriate. So they were getting very defensive and because they were not able to express themselves in a productive manner, they just started yelling at me like, fuck you, fuck you, right? Like all of these terrible things. Um, and it was like, whoa, like just this explosion of aggression simply by my stating that I don't want, you know, other men to touch my body without my permit, right? Like a pretty basic thing. But that manifestation of his emotions could only come out in this way that he had perceived as acceptable, right, for being a man, right? He could not engage in any sort of explanation with me. And I just think he really didn't have the tools to do it, right? And so it just, it manifested in this way. And so the conclusion here is not just that, right, simply Petrie is describing what's going on, but it's a normative one, that we ought not expect or encourage men to go through life in silence. Okay, and this leads us to uh, Michael Messner, who talks about how this, these notions of masculinity um, really take on an interesting sort of amalgamation in politics. So this is a really interesting paper. I'd encourage you to, to go through it in detail. I'm just going to highlight a few things from the remaining papers to try to keep this on the shorter side if we're not already going too long. So he uses here the um, example from Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So a a significant celebrity figure, not just in pop culture, but also in politics, right? And this notion of a kindergarten commando, which is meant to embody his um, character of a kindergarten cop, if you haven't seen that, you should, as well as um, the, you know, traditional military figure with, you know, all the machine guns, the commando part, uh, very aggressive and violent. So kind of combining two elements into the specific type of masculinity that tends to be modeled in politics, at least historically. Um, so again, right, he's referencing hegemonic masculinity. He talks about how this was dominant in the 1980s with this sort of violent guy, uh, violent tough guy persona, right? So this was a remasculinization, he says, in American society after the Vietnam War, right, because so many um, because of what happened as a result in that war, right, many vets came back um, and were being shamed, right, because of the way society viewed the unjust nature of that war. 
and we're just feeling very um, abandoned, right, and marginalized. And so this sort of overly macho man as weapon machine commando figure started to emerge in films, right, to sort of re-masculinize uh, American men, and especially American um, uh, military men, right, as a result of that. In the 1990s, though, this um, tends to be, again, we're seeing more women uh, and more of a demonstration, right, of, of other types of identities. And so that commando was a little delegitimized, right, because it demonstrated an instability in reality, right, that, um, you know, there has to be something wrong in order for the commando to be necessary, which we maybe don't always want to admit, right, that we need something like that. Um, and also, of course, the context is going to matter, right? The commando is not going to be the appropriate form of masculinity in every situation, right? And so we started to see other types of uh, masculinity demonstrated in the 90s, primarily in um, the private sector and business. And then we move into more humor in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, right? In the sort of self-mocking, care and compassionate, but again, men were only seen as doing this under the right circumstances and they would be seen as most often doing this if they were in charge of protecting children and that's where we get something like the kindergarten cop and so again Messner is combining these two notions to say that really the type of masculinity we see promoted in politics is this amalgamation right so there has to be toughness but there also has to be compassion, but it's not an equal relationship. In this concept of, hedge, of masculinity, toughness will always take priority and be the more important of the two characteristics, right? So the person always have to, has to be tough and they should be compassionate, but only in the right circumstances. And so again, this has been used according to Messner in national politics to stoke fear and insecurity of the other, Right, and again, to give the idea that we need a man in a political position rather than the quote unquote mommy state taking care of us. So again, the sort of delegitimizing and devaluing uh, of femininity. And the idea that anyone in politics, right, who participates in this idea that to be an effective political leader, you have to make sure the public is afraid, you have to make sure they feel insecure so that they rely on you as their protector. And you should always be tough, but only be compassionate in the very rare circumstances, right? If you participate in that, you're complicit in that model, right? Which is, again, marginalizing lots of men and women. Okay, so he goes through a series of events that help to demonstrate this idea, which I encourage you to go take a look at. Okay, and then the last two papers are about the social construction of hegemonic masculinity through two specific um, actions those of sport and those of violence. Okay, so the paper by Drummond on sport goes through a number of different sports and studies not just the conceptions of masculinity by people who practice these sports, but how it also affects their relationship with people in their lives. So I thought this was really interesting. So the idea here is, of course, that boys are socialized through organized competitive sport to be initiated into, right, this sort of manly identity to help build that manly identity, and then later on to help affirm it, right? So you're being initiated into it, typically through a series of, um, you know, maybe difficult times at the beginning, or maybe you get uh, especially bad <laughs> treatment, right? That we associate with different types of initiation. Then again, by participating in these sports with other men, you're seen as building certain skills that you need to be a man. And then again, when later on in life, someone embodies those characteristics that helps to affirm their manly character, right? And so this affects not just their values, but also their attitudes and skill sets. And so this dominant masculine body is seen as primarily three things according to this study. It's seen as being tough, it's seen as being superior to women's bodies, and unfortunately it's seen as being violent. And so according to Drummond, this combines misogyny with heteronormativity and homophobia. And this negatively, his study found that this negatively affects men's relationships with women, fathers, their peers, and other men by promoting personal health and well-being crises. So he 
goes over in his examples um, surf lifesavers, triathletes, and bodybuilders. And um, I was especially taken by the, the bodybuilding example um, just because one of my friends uh, is was in a relationship with a bodybuilder as they be entered into that field. And it was really interesting to see the values of the bodybuilding community change, not just him, but the way he was approaching their relationship, right? So by placing an emphasis on your physical look, right? Um, it encouraged him to be much more superficial, right? To be much more concerned about looks, you know, writ large and thus to actually serve to undermine any insecurity that he might have had in his looks before, because now all of a sudden your the value of your looks is only determined by someone else, right? The judges in this case, or whatever the standards are of that society. So some really interesting examples here, perhaps you can relate some of them to your own life as well. So the last paper is, um, Probably the most traumatizing of the week. Uh, lots of different examples by Kenway, Fitzclarence, and Hasluck describing different instances of violence that have taken place primarily in the workforce that have been used again to reinforce this notion of hegemonic masculinity. So we're looking here at all male groups and how they identify themselves, right, and how that tends to again reinforce this idea. So all male group identification, according to these authors, involves devaluing and contempt for the feminine, right? So the idea is that when we see groups of all, just men together, they tend to identify themselves in opposition to what it means to be feminine, and not just in opposition to, but with a sort of hatred or contempt, right? Looking down upon this other. And the idea again, is that that can create an anxiety and insecurity about one's own identity if again, you secretly do identify with anything like that, right? Because then you are afraid of showing that in the group, right? If those things are being devalued and con you know held con with contempt for, then of course there's going to be a form of policing by the group against any forms of femininity and then attempts to purge those uh, elements of femininity if they are found, right? So the group, right, through power and boundary maintenance is going to try to police and purge any notions of femininity, right? So this will be if there is, you know, any leader of the group, but also who is allowed to be in, be a participant, right? So maintaining those boundaries, not being exclusionary, not letting people in, but also again, through oneself, right? Through the hostility towards subordinated males and insubordinate females, right? So the idea is that if, you know, individuals in that group have or maybe identify with any of those things, that's going to be at odds with what the group is expecting. And so that can create hostility for individuals and themselves, which they might then take out on those around them, right, to try to make themselves feel better about the persona that they're performing. Right, so again, he's, uh, these authors are going to expand upon Drummond's work and find that it not only involves misogyny and homophobia, but also includes elements of racism, classism, and age discrimination, right? So again, I, I would think a lot of people could relate to hopefully not the more violence, violent instances accounted in this paper, but I think just the idea of facing a group that has existed coming into that as an outsider and navigating the, the personal politics, right? That you have to perform in a certain way to fit in, right? To be treated well, right? This can have all sorts of implications. So I encourage you to explore, um, you know, examples that you can think of in your own life that help to elaborate on these ideas. But the overall conclusion is that this produces sex-based harassment and violence. What's interesting though, is that it's often portrayed as if it's a game or sport itself, right? And so this goes back to some of those like sexist remarks, homophobic remarks, racist remarks, where people say like, oh, you just, you know, you're not, you're taking things too seriously. You need to lighten up, right? So by putting it in the form of something humorous, it allows these groups to get away with it, even when these instances of violence are reported to higher, higher ups, right? Um, people who might have an ability to do something, right? They might either perceive it as just being, you know, silly antics, not take it seriously, or they might even participate in it themselves.